Hey everyone, uh, I welcome you once again on the Baseline Show in India. We do this every Saturday at 6 p.m. Uh, this is the official office hours of Baseline Protocol. And uh, we are joined by, uh, of course, Mark Haddle, our, uh, our, our veteran for the India show. And, and he's, he's taking great pains in waking up so early, 7.30 in the morning and making it to the show. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, you've been amazing. Uh, we're also joined by Anushree. Anushree is quickly catching up on attendance of the Baseline show in India. And she's committed to now making it uh, on most of the shows. Thanks so much, Anushree. And, uh, and, and we have a very, very special uh, speaker with us today, which is Vishali Nagpal Srivastava. She's, she is a patent research analyst at RWS. I will let her talk more about her trait and her job, uh, but I would just end it with a, with a disclaimer that she's not representing her company. She's coming to the show as an individual on my individual invite and uh, her thoughts and opinions which she expresses today, it's just her personal research. Okay, so she should not be construed in as 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 her uh, uh, company's advice. So with that, uh, Vishali, uh, thank you so much for taking the time out for the baseline show. Uh, we are we are building a community in India currently, and uh, baseline is a is a global phenomena. It's a it's a way to synchronize. We are developing an open source protocol to synchronize systems um, in a secure and private manner. Uh, by using using blockchain, a common frame of reference, which is a blockchain right now. So that's how we're we're developing it. Uh, it was co-founded by uh, ENY Consensus and Microsoft, and then other big firms in the in the world they joined, likes of SAP, Accenture, uh, ServiceNow. Uh, they're all here. We've also done a pilot project with Coke One North America. Uh, now that happens to be an anchor project uh, for for the year which has just gone by. And then there is tons of uh, there are tons of updates which are lined up for next Wednesday's baseline show, uh, which is the global baseline show. And and uh, you know this time we're doing a general assembly, and it's going to be a two-hour long um, general assembly where we're going to be doing a lot of code demos as well as announcements for the for the year to come, and a, and a yearly wrap as well before we go off for the holidays. Um, especially in the West. So I'm not going to make Mark wake up so, so early in the morning in the month of in the second half of December. Mark, you just have to make it to one more show in this month. <laughs> okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So with that, I invite Vishali. Vishali, go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Tell us, tell our audience about, and, and you know, treat our audience as noobs in the term of, in terms of intellectual property, but because we're just getting started. A lot of community members are joining and most of the community members are techies. Uh, in nature so maybe you use those examples and jargon that you know with, with the right balance so with that i invite you to introduce yourself tell us a little more about your company what you do and and you know what do you see where do you see this heading mm -hmm. thank you samrat mark and anushree for inviting me to baseline show and it's it's the pleasure is all mine i would say um so yeah, myself, uh, you know, I have been working on patent research uh, and more of our intellectual property uh, research and different aspects of IP uh, throughout like my career in the last 15 years. And uh, have worked in different jurisdictions uh, uh, like uh, in India, in APAC region, and currently in the UK and Europe uh, region. And uh, my expertise majorly lies in patent research, uh, but uh, yes, have worked on sales side of IP, uh, commercialization part of IP, and also also uh, you can say portfolio management and other aspects of IP. Uh, so uh, that's how uh, different aspects we have been covering. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, Starting from scratch uh, uh, for, for our audience, uh, I can say that intellectual property research as the term comes, IPR, uh, you know, it's just a very basic literal meaning like that anything originating from your intellectual uh, uh, thoughts and uh, ideas is, is an IP, is an intellectual property right. It's a property right, you know, as, as uh, can be awarded based on your thoughts. And, and hence anything uh, which you generate from ideas and which is new and uh, which is a, a advantage to the society uh, which we 
term as utility, you know, the term is called as utility, so which is of use for, for society. It's not destructive, of course, uh, uh, you know, those things come under intellectual property right protection. And uh, largely it's, it's uh, uh, framed under uh, trademarks, uh, which is for protecting the brand of a company, copyrights, which is for protecting ideas for, uh, uh, you know, literary work, paintings, music, and even, even your technical codes, uh, the coding language which is, which is used. So copyrights for those. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, trade secrets, uh, which, is, which is something which you cannot bring in public. You know, those, those aspects come as trade secret. It is geographical indication for things which are linked to a particular geography. And at the end, it comes as the main thing, which is patents, patents or patents, uh, you know, however you can pronounce it in different places. It's, it's termed differently. So uh, that's basically for all the inventions and majorly related to technology aspects. So that is what uh, uh, I have been majorly working on. My background has been mechanical, uh, mechanical engineering. And from there I picked up IP, uh, majorly started working on patent research, initially on mechanical uh, aspects of inventions and uh, slowly uh, I added the uh, legal expertise by uh, doing law courses in my in my career and adding more intellectual property knowledge. So that's how uh, you know people who proceed on uh, patent work might might want to go ahead. That's how you eventually move on the patent attorney roles and all those things. So you need a technical and legal expertise for the, those things. So uh, uh, you know, uh, as far as uh, now patents are concerned, it's very interesting. Though uh, I would say they are a way of shaping up uh, uh, technology globally, uh, you know, and also for a country, uh, you know, the way it grows, uh, uh, things, the way technology develop, it's it's uh, the way uh, in industrial advancements in a country happen, and uh, they only happen when you have protection over it, you know. Otherwise, anybody and everybody can do things. Mm -hmm. uh, there won't be any any uh, monetary or uh, commercial benefits out of things. So how, how will the economy develop? So everything is, yeah. you know, linked with the technology, technical development. We can see like, you know, the world evolved from industrial revolution. Right. right. And, uh, that is where uh, people like Thomas Alva Edison came into picture. And they actually, uh, they might not be, uh, you know, they are theoretical, uh, I would say, inventors of fun. They might, we, we have been claiming that there have been so many thoughts about, uh, inventing electricity and so many uh, people might have thought about but he holds a patent for it and that is why he's called the inventor of it you know so that is how uh, unless you register anything over a registering body uh, you know over a legal authority until then you can't have protection over it so that's how uh, everything comes into picture and uh, uh, that's why this domain itself is very important very interesting oh. yeah. so so vishali and thank you so much for that for that you know setting the context of this conversation and you know bringing in some really um, you know you you tried to really dump it down for us and thank you thank you for that i asked you for it but what you the important aspect that you brought in was protection i think that ip protection that is that is the key for all the conversation that we're that we're looking at in fact my own company you know we applied six patents last year i think it was last or last two years back and nothing really moved. You know, even I, as a layman, started doing courses on WIPO. Just, just going through WIPO courses, um, of course, freely available stuff. I didn't, I didn't pay anybody anything for that. But, but I started research just to understand what this world is and how complex this is. And I paid so much money to somebody to do patents. And why is it not really getting, why is it not moving? You know, so, so I think that's, so, so when I talk about my side of the world, people see it as two two things. You know, when we talk about patents, we we talk about you know one side on one side people get rich doing patents, okay, and on the other side people people say that oh you know what you never get patents, mm -hmm. and and it is understandable for people to to sort of say that oh you don't get patents when when they've not really invented something they have tried to copy something out, uh, but. For, for people, how do people get rich with patents? We're going to come to that point, okay? But save that for later in the show. Uh, what I want you to touch upon is, you know, what are the various steps involved when, when we talk about intellectual property? How do we see it? How do you classify intellectual property? 
for a company for an individual um how is it important you know how is it and and you know why because we are on the baseline show we'll also talk about transferability we also talk about rights uh let's talk about you know how is data related to these patents protected and shared as and when required mm-hmm. so so please try and touch upon those aspects as well right uh you know as we uh, talk about patents uh, uh, we talk about first inventions uh, you know from there everything originates and uh, from inventions you move on to uh, uh, putting it in a particular format and then filing it ahead mm-hmm. with the patent office pharma alexa <laughs> so uh, uh, you know uh, that's how uh, you can say the data aspect comes into picture that there's a lot of data which is related to different inventions and all that needs to be collated at a place uh, you know now uh, i would say that you know to start with patent is a jurisdiction specific thing every country manages their own intellectual property so it's a country specific right that you get it's like you know your house property is in a country you can't claim those rights by going somewhere else it's also uh physically located there but uh, similar intellectual property rights you get right now in a particular country if you want this right in another country then you need to go ahead and file in the se- in the country separately okay so uh, every country maintains their own databases where uh, the filed uh, copy of your invention in a particular write up manner we call it a patent application draft in that uh, uh, code uh, you can say uh, systematically written format is submitted okay now uh, from there it has a particular life cycle where uh, within uh, 12 to 18 months it is first published okay so when, once the data is submitted it is grounded it's not physically available anywhere but uh, making it available on a website means they are publishing it further okay so once it is published that is where everything comes into picture that now you can access that data now it is in the public domain how you get grant over it as a right is much later you know that it involves lot of uh, uh, steps like there will be a technical examiner allocated to your uh, application once it is submitted and then they will assess that application over uh, uh, its novelty and over its use and different other legal aspects of getting a patent and then only it will get granted and the whole process goes for 3 to 4 years in most of the countries okay so that's why um, you might be still waiting for your yeah. uh, uh, applications and it again depends on uh, how much pointers it is qualified by the examiner mm. so uh, you know and there's a back and forth communication between the applicant and examiner on the questions they will raise and then you need to answer those then finally it will get granted okay uh, oh. they also conduct a test over it like checking the novelty by doing further research on whether there is any prior art similar to that or not so that is how the process of 3 to 4 year goes but the data aspect comes into picture right once it is available at the public domain okay mm. and that is where uh, researchers and uh, uh, anybody who is in- interested in that uh, as in that domain will uh, be able to access things so how it happens is that uh, once uh, uh, you know the data is published it is available on the country's website country's patent website or intellectual okay. property website okay. for example uh, uh, uspto.gov is a website which is owned by a uh, us patent office and they will publish anything after 18 months of your application submission on their website as a as a publication uh, similarly espacenet is the website for european patent office uh, which is epo okay uh, now wipo publishes their own uh, it's called as pct application Uh, so wipo publishes those applications then indian patent office has their own gazettes where they can publish i would say about 20 years back or 15 20 years back things were actually published in physical libraries there used to be physical papers available and they used to be called as gazettes and they were submitted in the patent office libraries in delhi uh, you know 
near Dwarka, you have the patent office. We have done that in the early ages that we used to go to the library and search from there. Similarly, uh, so everything is now digital, but yeah, it, it used to be a tough, tough time for earlier researchers, I would say. So uh, that's how things are available in public domain. And now what happens is like, uh, you know, uh, data uh, centric people or people like, uh, you know, companies which are actually preparing databases of, for consolidating this information from different countries. They will access the, uh, they will have rights to access APIs of those uh, websites and pull out the published application in, in a particular time schedule, you know, like every day they might be pulling out data or every quarter, every month, they, once they might be pulling out data. For example, one of the consolidated uh, free database example, which I can give you is Google Patents. Okay, so patents.google.com, if you open, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a consolidation of different countries. Now, where, from where is it getting the data? It's actually not uh, uh, getting the data in, in any other way. They are accessing each country's website of patent uh, uh, publications and then pulling out data and compiling them. Once it is pulled out, then any the way any database would work, even the way Google works or uh, Google Scholar works, uh, it it indexes everything together. Uh, yeah. You know, makes it accessible for the user to search it through different um, categories like keywords. Uh, there are other things like uh, patent classification, uh, which is a way of uh, which is a standard way of. In, uh, indexing it uh, as defined by uh, WIPO and uh, other patent offices they have sit together and created a consolidated classification code for this super, data. Super. I was just going to ask you that because when you said yeah. that there are so many countries involved and so many government offices involved and so many publications involved, I was actually wondering how do they get right when I call an apple an apple, will you call an yeah. apple an apple in, in other part of the world? So I think you sort of answered so, that question that WIPO is acting as that, that liaison. Yeah, yeah. It's like UNO is there. Similarly, WIPO stands for, for us on IP. You know, it's I a centralized see. body that helps in, uh, uh, there has been different treaties, just like UN treaties. There have been different treaties on how to manage the, the uh, intellectual property uh, in different countries and standardizing it, you know, together for all jurisdictions. So uh, that's how, uh, you know, there's already a well-defined coding for each technology. Now, if you talk about, uh, you know, uh, in computer science, hardware will be, will be different, software will be different. Within software, uh, you know, uh, maybe I don't have very good experience with it, I'm a mechanical person, but uh, coming down to, to that level that blockchain will be different and, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, just a general uh, API aspect or other things related to software might be completely different. And those classes are already defined to those granular levels. And it is an evolving system. Uh, every time some new technology uh, things come, the classifications are updated. So uh, sure. there's a way to search through classes. There's a way to search through inventor names. There's a way to search through company names, the applicant companies which are there. Okay. And uh, so different aspects in keyword also things have evolved now. People do um, stemming of the words and bring in concept searching now. Okay. okay. So, uh, so there's also contextual in, searching. Yeah, the contextual searching like Google is Scholar. also in okay. place now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's there on Google Patterns. Uh, now. This is a free database, you know, once you come down to paid databases, which uh, probably like my company uses and different companies use. So there are different paid database services, which are more advanced, which have uh, access to like paid access to different countries. So they have access to the data even earlier. Uh, as far as I know, Google patent updates once a month, but other country uh, like paid databases updated on a daily basis. You know, and uh, their indexing is even more uh, uh, systematic where uh, over the machine uh, uh, machine level of indexing, there's a manual intervention and uh, oh, some okay. experts of those technologies come into picture and further refine the index. So their accuracy will be higher that way. Yes. Hmm, kind interesting of. to know that somebody is doing better at these things than Google. <laughs> 
Yeah, and then they create those things like, uh, you know, landscape of the technology and creating clouds and bubbles of the data already. I see. Where you can just, uh, you know, put a concept and things will come out. Okay. Hmm. Uh, now, uh, I'll talk about challenges in all this. You know, it all sounds very good that, yes, this is doable. Now the data is very well categorized. Yeah. yeah. The challenges come like, you know, why professionals like us are still there and we are doing a manual research on this data. And uh, com companies come to us for service where they need, uh, you know, an IP research to be done or a patent research to be done in a particular technology and give them uh, information like, are there still prior art existing? Do they have yeah. rights to go ahead and file such a patent? Like you said, you know, you file the patent. Uh, before even filing, if a research is done, probably it's a lot more time saving for companies like, uh, you know, uh, those who might be doing 10,000 filings in a country every year. Absolutely. Absolutely. We paid for that as well, you know. <laughs> we paid yeah, the yeah. so you, you paid and you are yeah. uh, uh, expecting return out of it, you know, like how quickly I can get my patent. But before that, you know, uh, any research in a before the filing would have helped you in giving a confidence that my patent will get successful in another right. three to four years. And, uh, you know, uh, this IP is well protected because my research is solid. So right. uh, that's where people like us come into picture. Right. Where uh, you know it's it's a very uh, 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 you can say automated with artificial intelligence and the data is well available. Is it but because I I, I, I keep hearing all these stories, but then there are these years of waiting. So it's sort of yeah. uh, contradictory. Mark, by the way, and so sorry. Uh, you, you know, I I I'd, I'd like to bring in Mark here because. Mark is an is a director of innovation, and and you know with with your position, Mark, you would have seen so many inventions or maybe new things happening, if not really, you know, inventions per se. So, what has your experience been with 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 patents? Well, generally, I mean, patent basically will you know give um, a jurisdictional blessing that you can profit from and also uh, defend against any imitators mm. or people. And uh, that is actionable in the legal system. Uh, you can actually take them to court. Without a patent, you really don't have that type of leverage um, because once you get the uh, patent, it is you know, recognized that you are the inventor and you are the uh, sole um, beneficiary of any type of commercialization. Yeah. Um, and so this is allows you to license, you know, give permission uh, to for others to use it, um, you know, provided that they compensate you for it. And so it's always um, uh, really interesting um, to see a lot of the things that are, you know, th that, that are patented. You know, I don't see it so much right now um, uh, in innovation. Uh, you know, certainly we used, uh, we'll use, you know, component ideas that, you know, have been patented that I'm sure that we have been licensing from, but, you know, right now in innovation, we're not trying to make any money off of it just yet. We're just trying to, you know, contribute to the body of work, you know, involving uh, the, uh, the idea. Uh, but in my former career, um, I was an insurance broker. And you would have many people that would come in and say, I have an invention here that I am going to commercialize. And in order for me to, um, you know, if, if, if it's an object that's going to be on store shelves or something that might be listed in a website or included as a component in a larger uh, invention, um, um, we need liability insurance, you know, oh. uh, should what we have. Uh, and... Um, you know, in order to do that, you have to uh, be very thorough. You have to put together an insurance application that includes all the product specifications, the patent, uh, if it's necessary. In fact, um, it's very common that you will use artifacts from the patent application that Vishali was talking about, you know, for, uh, uh, for liability insurance to secure a, a quotation for that. Um, and I've seen a lot of really interesting uh, things out there. When you look at it from a... Um, from a risk management standpoint, uh, you know, it make, make, makes for a lot of fun war stories and stuff. Um, I remember I actually had a, uh, a call from someone that needed uh, $5 million in liability insurance. And what he had invented in his garage um, was a uh, air pressure um, 
controller that would basically uh, control the, um, the amount of air pressure within a system. And this was going to be used in air braking systems on large vehicles. Now, there are only two types of vehicles that use air brakes, really. It's going to be large semi-tractor trailers and school buses. <laughs> and if you look at it from a liability standpoint, yeah. should that perform, <laughs> yeah. or you know, it, actually, it doesn't even need to be zeroed in uh, because there is a certain component part that would compromise the braking system. Uh, he is going to be draw. I mean, the, the invention will be drawn into any type of liability uh, lawsuit. Yeah. Uh, and if, so, I mean, we got to see so many that were that were really uh, interesting, so particularly within the medical field. Um, right. I had one that um, uh, people called me up in a panic and saying, "We need a million dollars in in uh, insurance coverage." And, uh, you know, I said, well, send me your, tell me a little bit about your product, send me some of your specs and everything. And this was a, um, an ostomy product, you know, ostomy. So, uh, and it is for uh, what, what we call neonates, uh, which are, okay. babies that are babies that are within a week of being born. And, you know, there is, you know, sometimes to where, you know, the um, gastrointestinal system has not fully formed or maybe kind of created a little bit of a, uh, um, a, a kink in, in the plumbing. And it's actually a lot more common than we would think, but, uh, and it's easily correctable, but it is invasive. You have to actually make an incision, go in, put in this particular ostomy product, and then leave it there uh, for about uh, probably 45 days. Oh. And then it can then be take, taken out. So, but um, what these people did um, was they invented a uh, more simplistic design that uh, this allowed for the infant and you know, the mother to be released at about the same time. So they're taking an invasive ostomy product and they are taking it home. Now, if you start to think about this, um, you have parents, brand new parents, and something is wrong with their child. So there's psychological things going on at the time there. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, uh, and oftentimes parents, you know, the brand new parents, uh, you know, unless they have had specific medical training are not going to know how to do this and are not going to be in their best mind because they are brand new parents. And so <laughs> um, you get to see some really interesting ones on there. So I was like, um, so you have a neonatal product that is outside of a clinical setting and you need a you only have to have a million dollars in coverage i'm thinking yeah you might i was just going to say that that this guy was very optimistic we <laughs> said a million dollars that's in all coverage. i'm required to have and so and actually a, 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 akin to pulling a rabbit out of a hat i found them um a uh, what, what we call a one dollar rate uh one million was ten thousand dollars and of course, they they screamed bloody murder. They said, "Oh, that's too much money!" Oh, that's and I'm like, "Take it or leave it." Do you want your million dollars? <laughs> you're paying a dollar to get ten. You're getting a whole million out there, and you're only paying a dollar, you know, or you know, one percent of it. <laughs> yeah, you got to see so many of those. So, you know, within patents, though, um, it, it's really interesting because uh, you, you of course have the use, but you also have to create a lot of the protections. Mm -hmm. um, that need to be put in place for any consequence that may arise out of the use or possession of your particular product or idea. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be tangible. I mean, yeah. if someone was injured by a, you know, judicious application of your idea, uh, you are going to be considered liable. So, mm -hmm. interesting. I, I, I don't know how Elon Musk is protecting himself. And he shares all his patents uh, with others. But we're going to talk about that when Vishali comes to commercialization. So, so yeah, Vishali, over to you. We were talking about challenges. And, yeah, and Mark, by the Mark, way... Mark, I, I agree so much with you. It yeah. is a complicated process. It has a yeah. lot of... Just because it is intangible, there are so many abstract things involved with it that, you know, how, how you actually get the protection and, and later on to commercialize. So first of all, it is very... It used to be an interesting 
you know, accolade for a company to have patents. First mm -hmm. of all, they were all involved. And now, now the, uh, the shift is towards how to actually make money from patents because at the end, it is your property. You know, just, uh, uh, it's not just, uh, if a company is investing so much in research, like he mentioned the example of pharmaceuticals or medical domain, yeah. you know, or to, men, to prepare a medicine, for example, the vaccines of COVID, uh, you know, cases which we have uh, been seeing, why the rights only uh, are given to uh, special companies like AstraZeneca or Pfizer, because they've done a good amount of research and that is how the vaccines have come. They have, in their research is also trials, which they might have done. And from there, things have, things have come. Uh, now, you know, every country is dealing with it like this. At first, the rights are given to those companies to manufacture and sell it to the governments and make it available to people. And at the same time, um, you know, it's, it's they, uh, the governments are ensuring that nobody copies it and starts selling something which, for which standard process of trials might not have been practiced. So in, in case anybody, any country, a company wants to prepare it, they have to go and seek the technology from those companies, take an authorization like a license or, or uh, you know, uh, approval from those companies, get their labs uh, uh, checked out first, and only then you can prepare such a thing. Because if the vaccines fail, it, it's a major hazard for, for humanity. So... Uh, Coming to pharmaceuticals, it is it is a major uh, aspect of protecting their intellectual property. And uh, once it comes to commercialization, I think pharmaceutical companies do benefit a lot because they 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 do uh, uh, have different costs as associated with the medicine, and that's uh, you know that's where we, they uh, try to uh, uh, compensate on their research. Uh, the challenge actually happens in software cases, I would say. Because so, Sally, I, I actually had, had a question within the pharmaceutical um, uh, space. Uh, within the U.S., um, uh, it is uh, you can expect um, pharmaceutical companies will spend um, for every successful drug that is released, they have spent close to one billion dollars and invested probably anywhere from five to seven years of research. Um, once that is granted, you know, in pharmaceutical. Uh, as a matter of public policy, that patent protection will sunset. Uh, they only have eight years that they will be able to, uh, you know, have exclusive rights, right. um, yeah. you know, exclusive rights to produce it themselves or license others. And after that has um, expired, uh, then they no longer have the patent protection, which is why you have generics. Uh, right. Because it is a chemical, you know, formula that can be synthesized in a lab, scaled up to production. Um, does that exist uh, in India and elsewhere in the world to where you ha only have a small window of time that you enjoy that patent protection? Uh, yes, Mark, that's a very good point, actually. Uh, so it is an exclusive right bound by a time period. It's not a lifelong exclusive right. Uh, so once the filing is done, usually as per uh, intellect, uh, WIPO uh, standards, it's 18 to 20 years of protection or exclusive right that somebody gets. And that includes the three to four or five years of grant uh, uh, period that you get. And that's why, uh, you know, for the medicines, it takes further long because in US there, there, there's an FDA approval, there's an orange book thing. Uh, I, I'm not an expert with it, but those are further procedural delays that uh, pharmaceutical things uh, expect in US. And that is why the sunset might happen uh, much later, as you're saying, eight years. Usually it's 20 years in US for any patent to have exclusive rights on it. Mm -hmm. And that is when generic players come into picture. And from there, after the rights have uh, finished, then they can start, uh, 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 you know, uh, copying the thing and then they can use it freely with, without any further permissions required from the applicant. So that's there. But then there, there are uh, techniques which other companies have started uh, gaining for, uh, for such technologies is called as umbrella protection. So they will go on with adding new inventions related to the same thing and uh, keep it filing in different uh, uh, time intervals. And that is how they will get more and more protection for a longer time. 
but definitely it ends somewhere somewhere for sure okay this is this is very interesting so and and you know vishali just to go a step further in the in the example that you took about pharma so if let's say these patents are licensed to a party to manufacture um is there a way to find out automatically that how what is the extent of manufacturing that they've done if let's say we ask for 100000 pills uh, of something have they done 100000 or have they done more uh, which they will rebrand as their own and sell it to the market so is there a way to automatically and uh, find out via systems and 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 that's what i'm just trying to find an angle for baseline that how do we how do we make sure that even while no, I, i mean i'm not asking them to share with me their you know their way of making it but is there a way we can find out what how what's the quantity they made just select values can we bring that back mm, see i i can give from uh, uh, examples which uh, something like a uh, production line is there you know and uh, uh, either you uh, license it out fully or you lease out your patent you know for a certain time period uh that uh, so and so company you are leasing out your technology and uh, enabling them to manufacture from there and you have certain percentage pr- uh, profit out of it uh now how how to monitor the units is something completely the way you will monitor a production line uh, or will be maybe through project management systems or, uh, or maybe through uh, you know by uh, end of year managing the balance sheets and then checking the production uh, capacity from there uh, generally these systems do have uh, checkpoints that there's no data fudge or any any other thing so it it uh, is very generic to other project management systems i would say so 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 you mean to say that yes okay there is a, there is a project management system but i think what it boils down to is the agreement between the two parties right so they can choose Definitely. their way they can yeah. choose their See, way of monitoring uh, yeah the license agreement or the lease agreement will have those clauses you know uh, usually it is like you know commercializing any any uh, thing like you know you you lease out your car for something you know then you know that if there are 10 rides done then you might you will get you know this much portion day then if you get 20 rides then further uh, you know you get more profit out of it so those those things then you would put a gps monitor and then check it out you know so it is something like this uh, uh, you know that when you are leasing out or licensing out your technology once you have done a full license then you yeah. know you sell it out and uh, you you earn one time out of it but you are doing okay. the lease thing over uh, two years a renewal kind of thing and then from there also you have a, if you have a clause of if so many production things are made then this is your profit percentage if xyz is done then other right. things so those those are the things that you would have in the contractual agreement that you would uh, you know that's that's like any other legal agreement you know depends on the clauses of the agreement i see, I see. The there's a lot of background noise on my side because i'm sitting very close to a road uh but yeah pardon me for that but yeah i think this is this is where the interesting part lies mark so mark what do you think yeah. do you, do you, so this was one area where i was talking to uh, you know vishali and anshri in the uh, when we were when we were inviting vishali as a speaker that could we could we try and fit in something so you know going by the example that vishali just took about gps which is i but i will still end up knowing the exact locations where the where the stops were made or where where the vehicle actually traveled i don't want to do that for example my contract is just about the number of trips so i just want one piece of information which is um, whether the trips were made so because because the net displacement of the vehicle will be zero the vehicle will take around a trip and come back but um whether that trip was profitable whether that trip was to a maintenance um you know to a service center or whether that was a commercial trip i just need a i just need a uh, i just need to listen into that system to, to to differentiate to be able to differentiate between those two kinds of trips you know whether i whether i was going for maintenance or whether i was going for a things to have gone okay so 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 yeah that, so do you think mark is that a good use case for uh for for baselining 
for baselining as far as you know looking at um uh you know di different types of trips and determining whether one was for maintenance or whether one was a uh, client or you know something that can be billed you know to some third party as opposed yeah. to something else um yeah i would say yes i mean and and where you would have the data sharing um generally this is where you start to look at who would want who would find this particular method attractive and i would say anyone that has a fleet of um you know large, a large fleet of vehicles uh that has a telematics um, um uh, program uh and stuff and telematics is basically not only am i you know uh, collecting data about the location and the trip of the vehicle. I'm also collecting data, you know, about the vehicle itself, as far as how long has the engine been running? Uh, what are the tire pressures? When was the last time it had a maintenance interval? Um, is it still running according to um, um, manufacturer's uh, specifications, the engine or the transmission yeah. or anything like that? Yeah. You know, and it's one of those where I, I don't know if you, if that's going to create a, um, a, uh, an environment uh, to where sharing in zero knowledge would really be um, um, necessary. Yeah. Um, one thing that I would talk to, and this is, I mean, as far as use case for, uh, for baseline, um, you know, goes back to the, uh, like my suggestion would be for the, uh, like the pharmaceutical. Oh yeah, of uh, course. I mean, I just took this as an example, but of right. course pharma, pharma or manufacturing a car itself, those could be the right uh, areas to, to point well, to. But I mean, it, but I, I look at it within clinical trials right now because clinical trials fall under, you know, a clinical setting, which means that all of the data in there is governed by uh, data privacy, a very robust uh, draconian mm. even uh, data privacy laws uh, with HIPAA and PHI uh, to where I'm not able to share any type of data and even... Um, now uh, you're starting to even have some challenges to see um, you know, if I can aggregate and anonymize the data, is that still actionable under the uh, data privacy framework? Um, and you, you've had a lot of blockchain uh, dominant solutions that are being introduced for clinical trials because you have a problem with all of this data sharing and pharma companies are gonna be spending close to around you know, averaging $7,500 per patient or subject per visit. And just depending on the nature of the medication that's being investigated, um, you know, there may be um, certain um, procedures or yeah. uh, protocol for consuming the drug and stuff. And we need to make sure that everyone is, is following those protocols so we can at least have consistent data. And you're going to have, um, you know, many actors within that delivery because you're going to have the pharma company, you're going to have the, uh, uh, the owner of the building that houses the clinic, uh, you know, the operator of the clinic, and then all of the different, um, uh, you know, people who are involved in that, uh, you know, are all gathering data and yeah. uh, can we share it in a, uh, uh, you know, highly restricted particular way. And they're used to doing this eventually, I mean, doing this right now. Um, but when they start looking at a blockchain solution, um, the actual um, physical or practical application of where do we put the plumbing uh, and, and how does that work? Who is actually going to uh, be um, governing the actual blockchain, that unifying element? Um, and that's when we say, you know, baseline, instead of having to really get too deep into uh, the solution, you can baseline your existing systems. You know, you're not introducing really anything profound into your process environment. You are just basically uh, um, allowing the method for that you can prove that universal state of synchronization, uh, which is what everyone wants to have within a clinical trial because it makes them go much much more smoothly uh, but it also cuts down on the time uh, you know by 40 percent and you know by shortening these uh, um, development times or at least data gathering times um, uh, goes a long way of actually you know ultimately realizing if the uh, drug is going to uh, reach fruition or not
Um, you know, anytime that you have these process environments that involve external people that you know are either unable or unwilling to uh, share their data, um, you know, it, it creates a little bit a little bit of a problem. And baseline offers a solution for that. You know, through zero knowledge, and um, you're able to prove that your record keeping syncs up with that of your counterparties. And you don't care what's on it. You just want to know that we are matched up. Yeah, we're in sync all the time. Constant state of synchronization. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so with that, we bring back Vishali. So why don't you also start talking about a little bit about commercialization now? Um, so so suppose you know we've we've gone through the hard part of of research and and we get the grant. Um, mm -hmm. What happens after that? How do how do companies make our individuals? How do they make money? What are the various setups and and where do you see uh, monitoring systems or or commercialization can be uh, automated? Mm -hmm. See, uh, yeah, that is a that is really a challenging part, I would say. Uh, because end objective is to make out money from from the intellectual property, and uh, it is easier if it is a product format, uh, you know, in manufacturing or in in uh, you know tangible format. If the products are there and it has a patent protection, then it is much easier because then it is uh, uh, you know something which can be easily sold. So if it is a manufacturing company which is uh, having intellectual property of certain things, they will end up making products and selling and making money profit circuit. If it is a pharmaceutical company, if they manufacture their own, own drugs, then they might be having, uh, you know, uh, or profit margins from there. So that's one way of commercialization that you create out products. The other way of commercialization is that you license out your technology. Small, uh, uh, you know, IP creators, uh, they might be just creating certain IP and then going out to bigger firms and selling out their uh, patents over as a license, uh, you know, thing. And then uh, uh, you you sell your patent and make money out of it, you know. Uh, that might be an aspect. Uh, there are other ways as well that, you know, uh, that uh, uh, the challenge actually happens in, in things like uh, software, you know. Because in general, uh, uh, as a concept, software patents are not allowed. Uh, even in Europe, it is not allowed. In India, it is not allowed. Oh, in it's US, it is, it is difficult. In US, yeah. it is allowed in the name of business methods, mm. uh, you know, business method patent. So what happens is like, uh, you know, you have something which is running over a computer and it actually goes from one router to another router. And uh, that is where uh, uh, the service comes into picture. Like, you know, I have a, uh, you know, a hedging system where I'm, uh, I have my algorithm, which will help you manage the funds properly. This is my, uh, you know, uh, technology. And yeah. uh, it will run between the systems and uh, uh, give out you better, better output from uh, uh, your investments, yeah. you know, but, where where is the data going the locations are not clear the right. uh, machines which are involved in it are not clear right. and uh, the people managing that uh, you know those things will not be clear so how will you make implementation of things how will you make enforcement you know uh, uh, enforcement is only possible if you can uh, uh, narrow it down or zero it down to a machine or to a person or a company or a location you know only yeah. then you will say this person infringed my technology isn't it but if it is running through different systems where you don't even know where the router will be going uh, mm. where is it located you know it's maybe somewhere in that antarctica the, the data is going to different data centers and then yeah, yeah, yeah. under underwater cable etc but you know <laughs> in this in the in the example that you just took so so the administration of this software can lie at one place, but the users can be can be anywhere. And in, and in that scenario, these guys will not be able to make any changes to my software program. Right? I mean, I've just created the software program. I have my administrators all set up, um, and and the, you know the value that the software is generating is insights. It is information, and that information Definitely. can be consumed on any part of the world. So. Definitely. So does does that still does that still have have a challenge? 
it, it does have a challenge because uh you know your information you know as a as a ip uh, filer i would be looking on to like who am i gonna go and uh, who's my infringer are you making uh, you know handling my data are you an infringer or, or any of the end users you know they are infringers uh, okay. you know who, who's gonna give me uh, money out of the infringement this uh, is very lawsuit. interesting because this is like free advice we're getting <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, that is where uh, I, I, you... I came across a company, Vishali, uh, since you brought up small companies selling their patents to larger companies, I came across a company which has no products and 600 patents. Right. And uh, that's all so, they were doing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, theoretically, uh, end objective of patent system is not to encourage such firms. They are our folders trolls and they are actually uh, just a uh, uh, creating IP and selling it to larger firms. The ob end objective was that, you know, the company creates their own intellectual property and pr creates pro product out of it. But definitely in today's world, to have better commercial aspects, such firms do exist. We shouldn't be denying okay. them. And the whole okay. patent system is evolving to, uh, you know, to uh, in a more eth uh, ethical way, uh, get these uh, uh, set of uh, things uh, now linked with the patent thing right. so it, it is evolving similarly for business methods they have uh, or pat software patents things are evolving right now now wherever they can correlate it with a module or with a computer system or with a with a uh, you know uh, physical system to it uh, those sort of inventions are now getting approved uh, mm. so if you tie it with a machine it, it is getting uh, somewhere uh, approved because then yeah. you know who is the end user and who will be the infringer. In that Actually, case. I did that. So I, yeah, that somehow happened with my patent as well, my personal patent. My kid is not happy, I think. You're probably <laughs> hearing her as well. So so I did that with my my patent as well. So it was like, it was a blockchain patent. And, and then it had a couple of iterations of questions and answers and then no blockchain patents were awarded, being awarded in India. This is 2017 or something I'm talking about. And then I combined that with a braking system of a car. Mm, right. And it sort of went to the next stage, at least with that. And it just, it just stayed there forever, but, but at least it moved forward. So I think it was, so I think it, it's, it's all starting to make sense for me. Um, and, and I'm sure people who are watching our show today uh, will also get some benefit out of this advice that you're giving us, Vishali. Uh, this is interesting. So you're saying that we should always tie, we should try and tie, not always, but maybe try and tie these business methods to uh, something which is tangible. Right. So I'll give you a very um, old example in our domain is, is about uh, GPRS technology, you know. How, how things in, uh, started were like three satellites were used to point out to a, uh, to a well, you know, and find out uh, where the oil, petrol things will be located. You know, that's how a, a three uh, array pointing was being used. And as soon as this technology was linked with a, a car navigation, it became GPRS technology. And from there, GPS came into picture and then all the whole navigation system involved. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the real thought about the thing was very different. It was used for locating petrol, uh, uh, you know, uh, wells or oil wells in, in oceans, but actually the end uh, uh, result was much better when it was uh, patented with an application associated with it. Like you, you mentioned an application, you tied it with a machine system. So, uh, you know, that's how uh, things are there. Similarly, uh, uh, hedging systems were very abstract and they were rejected by the patent offices initially. But as soon as you uh, zeroed it to stock markets and uh, uh, tied it with different systems, the whole thing evolved as a different new technology where now a number of patents are being filed. So mm. um, this is how, you know, uh, software domain or business methods are evolving right now. And um, so what are they tying them to? Are they tying them to servers, databases? Yes, they are tying, tying them to uh, data centers, uh, oh. you know, or maybe okay. bring it. Uh, they, they've accepted data center as a physical uh, thing. And even if it is located somewhere, the company owning it 
will be having its ownership and wherever their headquarters are there will be the jurisdiction they'll be charged to so uh, uh, that's how you know they are doing they are doing it through the servers you know they can reach to your system and find out like you know who actually infringed on the things and from which system things broke out so they are linking it with individual user servers also and uh, you know that's how things are evolving whereas uh, you know just a code if it is concerned it is under copyright still so if you write a code in a particular language uh, uh, using sql or you say any other html code or anything then it is linked with copyrights only and uh, even uh, uh, firms that create special codes or uh, you know actually have copyright protection and if uh, somebody on open source copies it they have copyright infringement over things you know and like that but as far as thoughts or software ideas are concerned if it is tied to a machine then it comes under under patent rights i would say so there a challenge is there in terms of commercialization but tying it with with uh, accepted level of machines which are now uh, you know in very well usage with people uh, is helping things and uh, you know uh, that's where uh, now the commercialization is is improving and firms like google apple ibm in their software patents they are uh, you know they have different ways of filing and they are filing huge number of applications so they are definitely making money out of it now you know that is why they are investing in this domain so i would say bigger players are make able to make well commercialization out of things now but yeah the challenge still lies with a small uh, uh, you know company which might have one idea and uh, they need to they can't make production out of it they can't actually uh, uh, own a data center so that uh, you know they can have uh rights over it yeah and uh, i think they end up then selling up their patents you know that, it's the small guys who suffer all the time you know <laughs> <laughs> no i think it, it is evolving and that is where um, you know maybe you can think about what what yeah. you, know, you can do to correlate them together and create a bridge between them and uh, bigger firms actually okay. you know, there, there are uh, thoughts around this on better commercialization for them by bringing the players together You know, okay so that brings me to you know very interesting question can firms co own patents and can they be commercialized in a way that these firms get a uh, part of the revenue so i'm i'm now trying to draw some parallel with the nft world uh, where where people are creating uh, and yeah i see i see mark now smiling uh, which is which is you know where we can have shared revenue streams among creators now these guys are creators and i'm talking about creators in in the sense of art uh it can be paintings can be piece of music uh fair you know which is the prevalent stage uh for nfts right now but people can people there can have co ownerships so is that also a possibility with patents can two companies and multiple inventors get a different share and can we also audit that whether people have been getting uh, the right amount or not right so all this is happening you know <laughs> uh with technologies like you know um, telecom okay it's it's an abstract thing which will be running over wires but mm. who's the end user the hardware device the mobile devices or the uh, you know laptops or other things are are there so if ericsson is making uh, you know things like they have a telecom technology in place where they'll be talking about how to transmit the signals or uh, actually uh, you know your samsung or your apple device is something which is letting those signal process and uh, things so there uh, uh, these firms have come together and uh, they are sharing their technologies and it is called as consortium of patents in different countries you know they create a consortium and they share the rights over the, that and then again there are aspects with it uh, you know that there will be uh clauses on how much they can share and uh, how long they can use each other's technology there will be renewals uh, or as per those agreements and how much uh, profit sharing or money sharing between it will be there between them and uh, you know also if they add more into those technologies like you know they add more inventions to those uh, particular technology then uh, whether they will have to bring it to the consortium or they have to again create you know have a trade deal okay. about it okay so those things are in place and then there are audits also that whether everybody is following 
the mm. rules uh, specified at the first place or not. And in every country, they'll create consortiums because it's a jurisdictional right. So they might have rights in China. A consortium right. in China will be different, whereas consortium in US will be different, you know. So uh, those things are in place, but again, only for bigger players so far. Mm, very for smaller player, very players, uh, individual inventors, things are, are still evolving. Exciting. So I'm sure this this keeps you on your toes, you know, the parent research thing. I used to think this is a this is a boring field, you know, it's a it's a boring desk job, but it seems like you've got a lot going on. Anushree, uh, what is I, what are your thoughts on, uh, on today's conversation? Actually, yeah, uh, it is quite a like an eye-opener to me because um uh, coming from a telecommunication background, I've been looking at the size of data in telco uh, side of the world and um, looking at the subscribers, the mobile data, etc. But on this parallel world where the patents are connected and uh, you have patents of almost everything, every product specification has to be uh, gone, going through this process. The, I'm just amazed at the kind of uh, the amount of data that it is generating per per day, per minute in every country. And uh, having this, uh, you know, how Vishali explained, like previously it was all manual and then gradually it became automated. So how it is automating and there is a central yeah. system getting established there, which brings us to back to this point of baseline where you know we would want systems to be in constant sync and yeah. there are systems which are uh, totally different like in pharmaceutical or let's say telecom uh, example that uh, we shall give there are systems yeah. which are totally different but the kind of patent data they have uh, they have to file needs to be referred at some level of course with the legal restrictions whatever comes with this whole uh, process, but yet there are so many uh, data that gets generated. So I'm just uh, thinking there is a huge opp opportunity probably where mm. we can you know, automate the things which were being done like on a monthly basis or yearly yeah. basis, like Vaishali mentioned. It is happening on a daily basis on certain paid uh, URLs. I was so actually wondering, you know, what difference would make if, if the database was refreshed on a monthly basis versus a daily basis, but I'm sure there is there is there is tons going on, and then there is you know I would love to brainstorm you know on baselining because you know imagine these biggies of the world six companies one patent going after them in various geographies how do you synchronize the use how do you yeah. know the usage data and you know if if that is a limitation for them right now then we could give them a way. To, to get into those kind of usage-based contracts. So for example, yeah. they're saying, you know what, it's, it's absolutely impossible, next to impossible to measure usage. Uh, let's just go with uh, annual, quarterly, those kind of contracts. And they also spend tons of money on auditing, I'm sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Vishali, they must be hiring third-party auditors to audit this stuff. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. So we're getting there. <laughs> this one yeah, more. right. Very, a very interesting aspect which I uh, realized out of this session is the infringement portion, which uh, like Vaishali mentioned that there is infringement. And yeah. because of that, the automation probably may be restricted because there, there's a need of manual verification and intervention, exactly. etc. But what I thought is that this is an old chicken and egg problem. Once you have a centralized system, which has all the data available over there, which can be accessed by, with a restriction, of course, with a proper you know, security system, data security that we implement in telecommunication sector as well. Uh, if, we, if that's there in place, then definitely the level of infringement also can be controlled. Uh, it will bring, be brought down. Of course, there, yeah, would still, there would be a roadmap to it. There would be a design yeah. to it. And, uh, yeah. It is a lovely thought here that uh, uh, we are exposed to this whole domain of uh, huge, enormous, gigantic data. I remember uh, talking to Vishali and she was telling me like uh, they deal with the vacuum cleaners. Now, every portion of that small vacuum cleaner is going through this process. So just uh, <laughs> it's quite interesting that uh, how they, and there is a versioning, of course, like okay. a small portion of it has a version and then yeah. it gets upgraded. That's how the vacuum cleaners come with the new model. Imagine people working for Boeing and Airbus. 
Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> going in Airbus is like, uh, you know, another set of 10,000 pounds at least. So every nook and corner, and it's not just a design, it's also the material being used. It is also, you know, the way yeah. it is being assembled together. You leave yeah. that. G the Gillette uh, Mac 3 razor has 30 right. patents, you know. So 33. <laughs> Just on the three or four razors, the Mac 3 version, <laughs> just that particular uh, interesting, know, uh, interesting thing. Uh, you know, if the other versions have other 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 aspects, so it is it is uh, a hell lot of data. At the same time, uh, it is a lot of it is an industry. You know, the way uh, U.S. litigation works on intellectual property rights infringement. Uh, the infringement suits go actually in billions. It, we all know how the Apple Samsung infringement the... infringement is the other side of getting rich of wire wire patents. You know, <laughs> uh, no, it's 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 not the right way of getting rich. But if exactly. anybody infringes, you have to protect your rights and get a benefit out of it. So you know, yeah. um, you can see here, like four hundred millions every for the first lawsuit only was uh, given by Samsung to Apple in the world. Okay. In the, in the, uh, and then there were more of such cases, you know, every everything had another uh, different cases for okay. it and where uh, 500 plus million amount was exchanged every time. And this was one country in the US, the same lawsuit happened in different countries, okay. So in <laughs> their compensations in China were different. Their compensations in India were different. And their okay. compensations in Korea was completely different. So uh, Europe was different. So uh, we all know, I um, mean, you know, a lot of uh, money is involved, but yes, it is still with the big players. They can uh, prove on infringement. They can afford the services, you know, right now, which are involved with research uh, in all this. Uh, but yes, for I think if you automate things, if you bring out more artificial intelligence into it, definitely the smaller players will also start benefiting from things. You know? Yeah. So uh, there's a lot to explore. Super, Mark. Is there any is there any insurance against these liabilities which may arise from infringement? Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. It is. I mean, but oh. the thing is, you have to you have to have insurable interest, and you have to prove that there is a uh, tangible there is a, is an economic loss uh, mm -hmm. or 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 injury that you know will arise out, out of that. Um, you know, e either uh, it failing to perform as it uh, as it's designed, or um, uh, you know, just in the arising in and out of the intended use, uh, should wow. something break, you know, on there. But you know, another thing, you know, like the Charlie was talking about, um, you know, when it comes to software, um, you you have a persistent problem when it comes to territoriality because if you create something, it can be consumed easily anywhere in the world. Anyway, so, yeah. I'm thinking and, of metaverse, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you have to say what is the jurisdiction uh, where it's going to. There, there has to be a resolution of a dispute. Uh, you know, it's very common that you will have people that will manufacture a product, you know, either software, you know, that can be you know consumed anywhere globally. Uh, but if there is a problem, you have to bring the lawsuit in a U.S. court. Mm. Um, and many licensing agreements, you know, are going to include that element of territoriality uh, that, you know, if you're going to use our particular software and there's a problem with it uh, and you want to sue us for it, you have to do it in a U.S. court, you know, or some will say even a British court because the, uh, you know, and, um, you know, I, I imagine India is very similar because those legal systems were modeled after, you know, or, or show, show a lot of commonality, so. Um, it's interesting, you know, how you come into the territoriality, but, um, and, and I'm sure also that you would have, um, you know, local jurisdiction taxes, uh, you know, if you use a certain type of, um, uh, and she was talking about, you know, within telecom, uh, that, uh, if you use something, you know, uh, connect onto someone's public, you know, a certain country's public network, they want to make sure that you are paying for the use and they're getting the re revenue. Uh, after all, they built it and they maintain it. They want to be, and if you're using it, you, they want to uh, ha have you pay for the use of it. So, um, 
you know, a lot of the process environments out of there, it's, it's, it's interesting to uh, uh, really look at it, so. Definitely. Great, guys, I am not so this sure, was a, yeah. Yeah, this, so this was a very interesting, so very, very interesting conversation, Vishali. Thank you so much for bringing us all these insights for, for today's baseline show in India. Um, and for our viewers, please do uh, subscribe to this channel and go on to baseline-protocol.org. That's our website. It's, it's under revamp. Uh, you're going to see a lot of new sections on the website very, very soon. But for now, just go to the Get Involved section and uh, do follow us uh, on, on Twitter and YouTube. Uh, get involved on our Slack channel as well. So with that, it's a wrap for today's Baseline Show in India. Thank you so much, all of you, once again. Um, Thank you, guys. Thanks. See you, see you next week.